Every day in the Australian outdoors, people get themselves into situations just like this. You might have been on your way out to do some bushwalking, perhaps doing some caravanning, or maybe just out exploring our beautiful outdoors. The thing to remember about a situation like this is that with the right mentality, skills and equipment, you can deal with this situation quickly and effectively. Sadly, however, it's an everyday occurrence like this which has begun a tale of survival for many unprepared travellers. And in some cases, it's even begun a tale which has ultimately ended in tragedy. Out here, temperatures in the mid to low 40s, without adequate water and protection, we'll be lucky to last more than three to five days before passing out from dehydration. If we panic and run away from the vehicle to go and find help, we'd exhaust ourselves within hours. In a situation like this, it's not what you know, but how you apply it that makes a difference. Plan for the worst and hope for the best is an old survival saying. With proper planning, a situation like this, at best, is a minor setback, or at worst, a comfortable day's wait for help. We all tend to think about survival as rubbing sticks together and hunting wild animals. In reality, the true survivalist will probably never have to do any of those things because we've been prepared to deal with a variety of circumstances right from the beginning. Here I've laid out a number of items you should strongly consider taking if you're going to be heading outdoors, and all this is in addition to your normal camping gear. I've divided the gear into two groups, gear for me, gear for the car. For me, I've got a number of items, most importantly, a medical kit. Water, bank on at least 15 litres of water per person per day if you're heading out into an arid environment and some way of boiling water if you're able to find some more. A map and compass and very importantly a personal location beacon. For the vehicle, I've got a number of items which will help recover the vehicle, whatever the circumstance, in a number of ways. A long handled shovel, really useful for getting sand out from under the differential and the spare tyre. A pair of max tracks, jumper cables and a snatch strap, an air compressor, tyre puncture repair kit, an exhaust bag jack, spare tools, fuel, tyre lever, oil and coolant. And with all this, you should be able to get yourself through most circumstances. You may wonder what the point of taking jumper leads and a snatch strap is, given that I'm only out here by myself. However, arguably, your snatch strap is the best item you can have for recovery. And if someone else does happen to come across me, I can't guarantee they're going to be carrying one, so better to be safe than sorry. Even without all the recovery gear, there's still a number of things we could have done to prevent us getting into this situation. And the most important of these is this. There are no hard and fast rules about how much pressure you should let out a tyre when you head off road. But ballpark figures, let's say you're running 38 pound on the black stuff, when you hit the dirt, you want to be dropping out to about 30. As you head onto the sand, you want to let that down to 15, and if you're really, really in soft sand or you're bogged, you can let that right down to about 8 psi before you risk taking the tyre off its rim. The idea behind letting pressure out of the tyre is that it bags out the tyre, increasing its surface area contact with the ground, and that greater footprint will give you a lot more grip. Of course, a very vital little piece of equipment if you're going to be doing this is a pressure gauge, so you know how much pressure you've let out of your tyre. If you haven't got one of these, you'll probably need to let a lot more air out of your tyre than you think. It's important if you feel the wheel starting to spin and lose grip that you stop straight away. Don't go dipping yourself in any more than you need to. Go out, let all the tyre pressures down to the correct level, clear away a little bit of sand, don't go digging any big holes, engage reverse, and you might well be able to drive out. There's one item that'll really make your life easy out here. It's one of these. It's called an exhaust jack. It's really important when you're using an exhaust jack that you use it properly and in line with the manufacturer's instructions. Begin by clearing air out under your vehicle so that you avoid any potential punctures. Next, position the jack so that when the bag inflates it will lift the corner of the vehicle that is lowest. Avoid placing it under any hot exhaust pipes. With your engine off, connect the pipe to your exhaust. Start the car and once the bag is inflated, turn it off when your tyre is just above ground level. With your tyre off the ground, 
really packing sand and any other materials you can find under the hole before you deflate the jack. Be careful to stay clear of the jack when it deflates as they can drop quite quickly and they let out lots of deadly exhaust fumes. Another really excellent recovery product that's now available on the market are these Max Tracks. You can buy them from your local ARB dealership. To use them, you begin by using upside down as a shovel. Clear away any sand in front of your tyre. Having cleared a path of exit, you want to turn them up the correct way and then wedge them in under the tyre nice and firmly. With that done on both front tyres, get back in the car, put your car in low range first and drive out slowly. But what if I hadn't been able to improvise a solution to the problem? In this situation, the next question is crucial. Will I rescue myself or will I wait to be rescued? There is no right answer to this question as every survival scenario is unique. However, many have lost their lives needlessly because they answered this incorrectly. In most circumstances, your best option is to stay with your vehicle. However, in some circumstances, if the path to safety is clear, attainable and or danger is imminent, self-rescue might be your best option. Whether we've decided to wait and be rescued or to rescue ourselves, the next step in a survival circumstance is universal. We stop. STOP stands for Stop, Think, Orientate and Plan. STOP. Calm yourself and recognise that whatever's happened to get you here is past and cannot be undone. THINK. Your most important asset is your brain. Take no action until you've thought it through. ORIENTATE. Take stock of your equipment and surroundings and try to figure out where you are. And lastly, PLAN. Make a plan for each of the priorities. Firstly, signal. Second, water. And third, warmth and shelter. Equally important to a good survival plan is to maintain a positive mental attitude. Survival history books are littered with stories of men, women and children who have survived in the most hostile of conditions, sometimes with very little equipment or survival knowledge. Equally, there have been those who have had all the knowledge, skills and resources and yet still died. It wasn't their knowledge that left them in their hour of need, rather they let their fears and anxieties get the better of them and ultimately they died in a state of hopelessness. Through setting goals like seeing loved ones again or drawing strength from prayer and meditation, survivors have been known to stave off loneliness, depression and boredom, and most importantly of all, they maintain that crucial will to survive. There is no one survival plan, as every situation will differ in terms of the resources and the environment you're in. Anyone travelling in the Australian outdoors should really strongly consider carrying one of these with them. It's a survival kit. You could buy one like this Bob Cooper kit or you could make your own. The survival kit's basically a small box containing a number of multi-purpose items which, with a little bit of practice, can be used to procure your necessities of survival. There's a number of them available on the market but they all pretty much contain the same elements. A signal mirror. Tick the mirror close to your face and find the focus point on the back of your hand before aiming it at a plane. Puri tabs. Place one of these in one litre of water, wait an hour, and the water is safe to drink. A whistle. This may help your rescuers locate you if they are in close vicinity to you. Flint. Pull the flint back against the striker to focus hot sparks on dry tinder to start your fire. A knife. This is the most important survival item as it's used to help procure all your necessities of survival. If you do happen to find yourself in a situation like this and you don't have a survival kit, don't give up. Your vehicle is a giant survival kit and Mother Nature, she'll provide you with many your other needs for survival. All you have to do is be a little bit resourceful. Part one of your survival plan should be to signal, and you need to do this as early as possible. There's a golden rule in desert survival, and that is never leave your vehicle. The rule exists for two main reasons. One, your car will provide you with all your basic needs of survival. And two, 
it can be easily seen from above. From up here, a human can be invisible. But that car over there stands out, and because you left the bonnet up, people will recognise that you're in need of help. Your bonnet's a good signal, but we could still do better. For example, we could take our thermal blanket from our medical kit, tie it around an improvised tripod and put it on top of the car. It'll make a great reflector. The thing about signals is they're only going to be effective if they can be seen or they can be heard. So you've got to think about where your rescuers are most likely to be coming from or where your signal is most likely to be seen from. Contrast is essential if your signals are to be seen. You can create contrast in your signals through the use of different colours, horizontal lines, reflections, size, etc. An even more effective technique for attracting attention is the signal fire. The idea behind a signal fire is that green vegetation burnt on a fire will send a plume of smoke up into the sky. A tyre or a tree could also have been burnt for the same effect. Here I've built the fire in two levels with lots of dry tinder down the bottom and green vegetation up top. The air spaces between the levels supply plenty of oxygen to the rapidly burning fire. If the conditions aren't too windy, a really well made signal fire like this will send a good plume of white smoke right up into the air where it can be seen from miles around. Flares are a really good example of why it's important to think about contrast when signalling. If you were lucky enough to have one of these orange smoke flares, you'd be best using it in a cleared area during the day if you could see a plane. Using it at night, however, would be completely useless. A red flare, by contrast, can be seen well during the evening or night, but it's not so effective during the day. This rear view mirror, a polished can lid, metal foil, sheet metal, a CD, or a signal mirror from your survival kit can all be used as very effective reflectors. Three of anything or a triangle is a universal distress signal. Electronic communications have come along so far in the last few years and today a couple of hundred dollars could literally be the difference between life and death. If I could take just one item with me, it'd be a personal location beacon. A POB, or Personal Location Beacon, also known as an EPIRB in a marine setting, is a device which sends an SOS message to the authorities, and if it's GPS enabled, they can pinpoint your location to within 50 metres anywhere on the globe. This is absolutely perfect. I've been following the lie of the land downhill for the last little while and what I've been looking for are these trees here, the paper barks. Sure enough, as soon as I saw them, they've put me onto the water. Well, it's not quite water, it's a dry creek bed, but uh, with a little bit of luck and know-how, we'll be able to find some water here pretty quickly, I reckon. It's a good start. Part two of your plan should be to acquire water. Water makes up 72% of the world's surface area, and yet only 2.5% of it is fresh. It's an essential ingredient in all forms of life, no more so than our own. It makes up 78% of our bodies, and is so vital to our body's performance that even at 2% dehydration, our body's performance is significantly impaired. Heat, thirst, and exposure. These are the real killers in Australian survival stories. To give you an idea of just how much water your body needs, in 40 degrees, if you're working hard, you could need up to 15 litres just to stay fully hydrated. First is a really poor indicator of your body's true water needs. So the moral of this story is you really need to ration your sweat and not your water. During the mid to late 40s, the US government did some interesting studies into the effects of dehydration on their soldiers. It was called water disciplining and it was a complete failure. 
Not only did it reveal that soldiers could not be conditioned to survive on less water, but that the effects of dehydration was devastating in terms of the human body's capabilities. Your vehicle itself can also be a good reliable source of water. While your radiator and your windscreen wiper fluid are generally a bit of a no-go, unless you've been slack like me and forgotten to put detergent in it, there is one other option, your air conditioner. Leave your car running and your air conditioner on full. That way you can catch the air conditioner runoff as it comes out the bottom. Nice thing about this technique is you can get back in the car and work on that survival plan of yours in the cool. Well, it's a start. But there is an even more ingenious way of using your car to get water in a survival situation. And all you need is an alarm clock and a cloth. During the day, your car will heat up and at night it'll cool down. This change in temperature will promote condensation in much of the bodywork. All we now need to do is mop it up and squeeze it out before it evaporates. The same principle can be used to mop up the morning dew from plants or grasses. Water collected from poisonous plants is may be tainted, so it's best to stick to grasses if you're unsure. But this alone isn't going to keep us alive for too long. Australian trees have become masters at living out in these hot conditions. They send their roots down deep and pump the water back up out through their leaves. A big eucalyptus like this one will probably transpire up to 200 litres of water per day. So if we want a drink, all we need to do is capture that water as it's leaving the leaves. For the best results, preferably you want a big bunch of leafy green leaves that are in full sun. That way you'll get the best results. This technique is called the transpiration bag technique and to perform it you'll need a large clear plastic bag and some string. A black bag will not work anywhere near as well. If you don't have any string just improvise. A shoelace or strips of material or wiring cut from your car will also work perfectly well. Once you've enclosed your entire branch in your bag you need to tie this as tight as possible. You could try wadding up the opening with some cloth to help make a better seal. Collect your water every three to four hours to maximise the results. Well, the technique worked. Two or three cups of water like this could be a lifesaver in a survival situation. Similarly, down here on the ground, there can also be some good clues as to where to find water. Animals just like humans need water. They can be fantastic indicators of water. When the rain falls from the sky, it runs down the gullies and valleys till it collects at the lowest point, enters the streams, and the vegetation tends to be more lush. Well, it obviously hasn't rained very much for a while here, but it's not what's on the surface, it's actually what's under the surface here that could end up saving us. Even dry old riverbeds like this one can produce water. If you dig on the very outside of the riverbend and you wait a while, you might just get lucky and your hole will fill up with water. I mean, it might look a bit muddy and dirty, but this water, once clarified and purified, will be perfectly drinkable. Before water like this is drinkable, you're going to have to clarify it and purify it. Clarifying is different to purifying. Clarifying, you're just taking out all the debris and cleaning up the colour a little bit. There's a number of ways you can clarify water. You could run it through a piece of cloth like your shirt, but for a much more effective job, you need to bring up something like this. Here I'm just using an old bottle that I found in the back of the car, and I've filled it with one third charcoal, a little bit of cloth, some clean sand and some gravel, and this should do a good job.
Our water's nice and clear now, but remember that doesn't mean it's purified and safe to drink. The last thing you need in a survival situation is a stomach bug. Don't take any chances with water. Make sure you always purify it. The easiest way to do that would simply be to boil it. Water should always be purified, and the quickest way to remove viruses, bacteria and protozoa is simply by boiling it. You only need to bring your water to a rolling boil. Other techniques are to use an aftermarket purifier, UV light sticks, microfilter, chlorine, iodine and Condi's crystals. Having said that, dehydration can kill quicker than anything found in contaminated water. Therefore, while you must always try and purify the water if you can, if you have absolutely no other options, just simply do your best to clarify it and take a risk. From my experience with teaching people about survival over the years, what I've found is there is a number of common misconceptions when it comes to water. Three of the most common of these are drinking your own urine, drinking salt water and using a solar steel. The human body needs salt in order to absorb water and to maintain its metabolic balance. Salt water, however, has far too much salt in it and it'll actually rob your body of fresh water in order to achieve the balance, so never drink salt water. You can convert salt water to fresh water using a number of techniques including the osmosis pump, your solar still or your V salt tablets. To build a solar still you'll need a large clear plastic sheet and if you can get hold of some kind of digging implement it'll make your life a lot easier. Start by laying out the plastic sheet on the ground and dig a hole at least 40 centimetres deep within the perimeter of the sheet. Next, place any green vegetation you can find down the bottom of the hole and put a cup in the centre. If you have one, you can run a small thin plastic tube up from the cup. Finally, cover the hole with a large plastic sheet and seal the edges as tightly as possible. The last two steps are to make sure you put a rock right in the middle so that all the water will condense and run down into your cup. The basic principle of the solar steel is that the temperature under the ground is cooler than the surface temperature. This difference will promote condensation to form on the underside of the plastic which will then run down into the cup. Our well, solar still's been working for a few hours now, so we might just have a bit of a drink in here. But based on my experience, there's one thing I will guarantee about a solar still. Not much. So at best, your solar still is just a stopgap. You're barely going to get back what you've lost making the thing. You'll notice that no part of our survival plan is dedicated to food. And this is because that it takes many weeks for a hydrated person to die from starvation. If you don't have water, do not eat, because it only dehydrates the body quicker, and out here, dehydration is the real killer. Our signals are working and we have our water, but it still may be some hours or days before we're rescued. The reason we want a shelter during the day is to minimise our water loss. The best way to do this is to stay nice and cool. To stay cool, you want to stay in the shade as long as possible, minimise your strenuous activity, and if at all possible, get your bum off the ground. In hot conditions like these, you want to do most of your work early in the morning or late at night when it's cooler. During the heat of the day, you need to get out of the sun and conserve all your energy. Trees provide an excellent source of shade, but with a little bit of improvisation, your vehicle also provide good shelter. I could have used the car's roof lining, some sheets, a tarp, a parachute, or something similar to form a roof on the side of my car.
done. I've got my signal tower working away nicely now. I've got my shelter. Now all I want to do is just get out of this sun. Out here in the Australian outback, the days might be hot, but the nights can be very cold. Your car might keep you a little bit warmer. You can sleep in it, and if you've got petrol, you can run the heater for a few minutes every hour just to keep yourself a little bit warmer. But still the most effective way to stay warm is with a good fire. We take our ability to create fire for granted, but without all the tools of today, it's a skill that took our ancestors generations of practice to get right, and they valued it very highly. Part of the reason they valued it so highly is because it's so many uses from a survivor's point of view. Perhaps the three most important of these, the ability to sterilise water, to keep us warm at night, and to signal for help. It's essential to understand that fire needs three things to exist. A heat source, some fuel, and oxygen. A lack or abundance of any one of these three items will mean that the fire cannot start. The humble match contains the three essential ingredients for fire. The correct way to light one is to support the head of the match and draw it into your body, sheltering it from the wind until the flame grows nice and strong, upon which time it can be introduced to the base of your fire. Better yet, carry a lighter. When it comes to building your fire, you'll need to collect and prepare all your materials beforehand. If you're planning on keeping a fire in all night, you'll probably need to collect up to five times as much fuel as you'll think you'll need. When you're collecting it, you should collect it in three different layers. Firstly, the fine stuff. This is tinder. Secondly, your matchstick thin dry kindling. And lastly, your heavier, thicker fuel, which will burn longer and give you plenty of heat. I was able to collect all these from around here with no great difficulty at all. For tinder, you want something that's so fine and dry that it'll catch with just a single spark to ignite it. Here I'm using a combination of the fluff from the base of a zamia palm and some shredded up paper bark. Other tinders I was able to find around here were some dry grass and even some old rupu. It's all organic. For kindling, I've got some dry twigs, remember nice and fine, and the leaves from a dead grass tree. And for the heavier fuel, well any old dry dead standing wood will do. Remember, the key to survival fire lighting is to think small. It's not like at home where you've got the luxury of a whole box of matches and a big set of jiffy fire lighters. Think small, gather your materials beforehand, and you'll stay warm right through the night. The key to starting fire is getting really fine, dry tinder and a heat source. I could get that heat source from the car cigarette lighter, a magnifying glass, which could come from the medical kit or binoculars, the car's battery. In this case, I've used some steel wool as my tinder, or the flint from your survival kit. These man-made flints are fantastic survival tools. You can strike them an almost unlimited amount of times, and they even work when they're soaking wet. But if you hadn't had any practice with these, you might be surprised just how hard it is to light a fire unless you've got the correct tinder. One of the nice things about this flint, it's got a big block of magnesium on the back. It makes things a lot easier. When it comes time to light your fire, make sure that you've gathered all your fuel and prepared your fire beforehand. Having ignited your tinder, light your fire from the base.
When choosing a position for your fire, you need to take into account its proximity to your fuel and where you're going to be sleeping for the evening. There's an old Indian saying that the white man builds a big fire and sits far away, whereas the Indian builds a small fire and sits close. I guess the point of that saying is that a small fire can be perfectly effective for warming and for cooking. Sometimes it's a lot safer as well. Having said that, if you've got an abundance of fuel at your disposal, it's safe. A large fire is much easier to be seen from above during the night. It takes a lot less effort to maintain throughout the evening, and that's good, because it gives you time for sleep. Fire is always inherently dangerous, so you should always have a plan for putting out your fire. I should tell you, the fire bow technique should really only be used as a last resort. It's very time consuming to prepare, takes an awful lot of practice to get right, and you need to know the right woods. basic parts to your fire bow. A headstock, a spindle, the bow itself with the string and your base plate. All four parts should be bone dry. Start by cutting a hole into the hard headstock. Next, shave the soft straight spindle so that it is tapered at one end and blunt at the other. Work the sharp end of the spindle into the headstock so they are a good fit. Split the baseboard and after beginning with the point of your knife, work the blunt end of the spindle into the baseboard. Cut a notch at each end of the bow, remember this can be green wood, and securely fasten your string at both ends so the string is taut. Pre-prepare a bundle of fine dry tinder and sandwich this between two bits of bark. Keep this close by. I begin by slowly bowing back and forth until I get into a nice rhythm. Then stop and cut a V-shaped notch into the baseboard. Twist your spindle into the string and slowly begin to bow back and forth until you reach a nice rhythm. Then as the wood begins to bite into the baseboard I apply more tension to the string with my right hand by pinching the string against the bow and at the same time applying more pressure on the headstock. Bow vigorously till there's lots of smoke and then carefully remove the spindle. Let the coal settle for a few seconds before carefully placing it into the middle of your tinder bundle. Sandwich the bark around the tinder and blow into the centre until your tinder ultimately ignites. The golden rule of desert survival is never leave your vehicle. But there might come a point in time, depending on the people in your group and the circumstances, when leaving your vehicle to walk to find help is the best and the last option. If you do do this, make sure you leave a good comprehensive SOS message in an easy to find location. A lot of people would still be alive today if they just left a few vital details for their rescuers. At the top of your SOS message, clearly state the word help and the letters SOS. Remember, you cannot necessarily guarantee that the person who finds your SOS letter will speak English, but those two words are pretty much universally recognised. Next, state the name or names of the people who are involved and a description of them. Explain the situation that's led to you leaving your vehicle and outline the supplies and equipment that you'll be carrying with yourself. Clearly explain what your plan is once you've left the vehicle, including things like where you want to be going, the time and your date, and what you want the person to do if they find the SOS letter. That should also include things like who you want them to contact should they have communication devices. Having made the decision to leave, you need to take with you as much water as possible, some shelter, a survival kit, and at least one way of making fire. Most importantly, you also need to take a map and a compass. As you leave, you need to leave direction of travel arrows along the ground so that any potential rescuer can follow you if they find you.
When you do start moving, it's absolutely vital that you maintain your direction of travel, as in the bush, people quickly become disorientated and end up walking in circles. Ideally, of course, you could have a GPS or a compass, but the survivor not never be without a compass so long as he's got the sun and the stars. To use the sunstick method, place a straight stick around 40 centimetres high firmly into the ground and mark the tip of the shadow with another stick or a stone. The technique works because wherever you are in the world, as the sun moves in an arc from roughly east to west, it casts a shadow, and by mapping the movement of that shadow, we can find north, east, south, west. Now all that's left to do is to take a second small stick, mark it right on the tip of your shadow, take out your sun stick and place it across your two like that. One further stick, placed at 90 degrees, will give you your four cardinal points, north, south, east and west. If you follow that technique correctly, you should be accurate to within a few degrees. If you get confused as to which point is north and south, just remember if you place your left foot on stick one, that's the first stick, and your right foot on stick two, you'll always be facing north. Another simple and very effective way of finding your cardinal points is to lay your watch flat and point the 12 at the sun. Now extend a line out from your hour hand and halfway between the hour hand and the sun is north. This works in the southern hemisphere, but if you're in the northern hemisphere, you begin by pointing the hour hand at the sun and then halfway between the hour hand and 12 becomes south. At night, south can be found in the southern hemisphere by extending a line along the length of the southern cross until it intersects with a line running at 90 degrees to a line running through the two bright pointer stars. The bright pointer stars can be found just off to the side of the Southern Cross. Extend the line from this point to the horizon and this will mark south. In the Northern Hemisphere, a line drawn from the bright North Star to the horizon will give you north. Your map will always be orientated to north. To understand the features of a map, what you need to do is find the legend. The legend is generally located down the bottom or to the side of your map. It will help you understand the terrain of the map. Other useful things you might be able to find on your map are where you are on the ground, the topography of the lying land, watering points or perhaps exit routes. I said before that the true survivalist will probably never have to use many of the techniques that I've been discussing because it will have been prepared to deal with a variety of circumstances right from the beginning. While techniques like the transpiration bag and the bow drill all seem pretty cool, in reality they're complicated and it's much easier just to take 40 litres of spare water and a cigarette lighter. Tell someone where you're going, prepare your vehicle, plan ahead, you do those three things and you'll probably get through 90% of circumstances. A personal location beacon costing $500 seems pretty cheap when compared to the option of being out here for five days and surviving alone. Plan for the worst and hope for the best is an old survival saying, but if you remember it, your time out here will be a lot more safe and enjoyable. <laughs>